Thanks, Jeff. Um, first, just a little bit about myself. I have been working for the Michigan DNR for about seven months, just over seven months. And I work in the Sault Ste. Marie office just across the river from here. And I, I'm coming from Missouri. So I was a forest health specialist in Missouri for about seven and a half years. And in Missouri, we had the central hardwoods primarily, so a lot of oak hickory forest is where I was working. And I'm, I kind of hate to admit it, but in Missouri, um, we considered sugar maple to be a little bit of a weed. And so coming here, I'm still learning the, the northern forest a little bit, and so I'm really happy to be able to be here today and not only present, but to learn everything that's going on in Ontario in the forests. And, and I think that's just great. Um, my goal with the presentation here is to uh, give you a little bit of an update on the, the Michigan Forest Health Program. We've had a number of changes in the last few years. And then talk about some of the things we're doing to address our major invasive pests. And then mention some of the native pests that were um, problematic this year. So first of all, with our forest health program, uh, some of you may have known Bob Hyde. Uh, Jeff mentioned him. He retired a couple years ago. And then Roger Mack was our other forest health specialist that also retired. So we've got uh, myself in the Upper Peninsula, and then James Weiferich is our forest health specialist in southern Michigan. And then Scott Lentz, our link to the past several decades of experience in the forest health program and he's located in the, the lower um, peninsula, in the northern part of the lower peninsula. The other thing that's new is our forest health response team. And this is a couple of foresters and a technician with a, they've got a great deal of experience um, with the Michigan DNR as foresters. And um, their mission now for the next couple of years is to survey for some of our major invasive forest pests. And they're spending a lot of time surveying for uh, hemlock woolly adelgid as well as heterobasidian root disease, and oak wilt. They're helping with our aerial surveys as well. Now, um, in Michigan, the last few years, they've uh, developed this Michigan Invasive Species Grant Program that is providing quite a bit of funding to manage invasive uh, pests. And this would be more than just forestry pests, but aquatic pests and other, other types of issues as well. And um, so the, this program provides funding for prevention and control of these pests, as well as research efforts. And they, it also funds the cooperative Invasive Species Management Areas, or SISMAs. And you can see the SISMAs, these are different regions of the state. You can see that on the map there on the right. And um, within these SISMAs, there's staff with expertise in dealing with invasive uh, plants and uh, also invasive forest pests. So they have funding to go out and um, do management on public and private land. And, um, and they're doing surveys as well, outreach efforts. And they're helping quite a bit with hemlock woolly adelgid and some of our other invasive forest pests in Michigan. So hemlock woolly adelgid, that's a pest that we do have along the southwest coast, along the, the shore of Lake Michigan in four counties. You can see the heat map there on the right of the screen. and um, that probably represents where the, the most survey work has gone on as opposed to actually where HWA is most dense along that uh, shoreline there. So um, the SISMAs are doing a lot of survey work there. We have other cooperators as well and our forest health response team doing both survey efforts and treatment for HWA. They're focusing on the northern part of um, the, the areas where HWA is present and working their way south to try and um, stop or at least slow the spread of HWA into our northern areas where we have a lot of, of hemlock resource in Michigan. So in addition to this effort along the southwest 
coast, we also have survey efforts going on um, with about 10 miles, 20 miles actually inland from the shore going up the, the coast of Lake Michigan. And um, we're, we're hopeful to get funding to do survey efforts in the upper peninsula along the Lake Michigan shoreline as well in the next year. So those the survey efforts um, typically begin, or they're beginning now in the fall, and they'll go through the winter. We've got the, the treatment efforts ongoing as well. Um, in addition to the, the surveys and treatments, we're doing a lot of outreach about hemlock woolly adelgid. Uh, there's research at Michigan State University. The, the research is looking into winter survival of HWA as well as, um, uh, as treatments. Beach bark disease is a, another invasive pest that we've been dealing with for some time. It was first detected in 2000. At this point, most of our areas with a significant amount of beach resource in the Upper Peninsula have been impacted. We've lost a lot of that overstory beach. The map there shows the areas where the beech trees are being killed, where both the scale and the aggressive Neonectria fungus that causes the cankers is present. Um, at this point in time, due to both beech bark disease and EAB, emerald ash borer, we're facing a lot of questions about what's the future of these forests and how do we regenerate these forests. Um, we, in some areas, we've been planting some oak. In other areas, um, we're, we're still talking about what to do and uh, maybe some locations where we end up converting stands to conifers to red pine with um, heterobacidian root disease, which I'll talk about in a minute. We're having some impacts in some of our red pine stands and maybe we can move red pine to some of these other areas potentially. So a lot of discussion and trying to determine what to do as a result of those pests. Some other activities with uh, beech. Uh, since 2002, we've been identifying beech bark disease resistant trees and propagating those to develop seed orchards. And uh, research shows that about half the offspring of those resistant trees when they cross end up being resistant. So. Um, we also have a, a potted seed orchard as well where we're already getting some seedlings. And in 2017, uh, resistant seedlings were planted on the landscape for the first time in the northern lower peninsula. Heterobacidian root disease is an increasing concern for us in Michigan in our red pine stands that have been thinned in the past and we get these expanding pockets of mortality. Uh, we're spending a lot of time uh, surveying for HRD, and uh, we do those surveys typically in the fall. You see on the right side the, the fruiting bodies of the fungus. They're quite evident in the fall of the year, and um, so those surveys are ongoing right now. And uh, where we have HRD present, then we have higher levels of the, the spores in the area and increased concern about infection when thinning activities occur in our plantations within that area. And in Michigan, we're um, using a five-mile buffer with the idea that where you have HRD present within five miles, the risk of additional infection when thinning occurs would be highest with the idea that when you thin, you've got cut stump surfaces, and uh, those cut stump surfaces would be where the spores land, infection occurs, and then the infection moves through the root systems into adjacent trees and causes these pockets of mortality. So if you go to our website, and we have a link there at the bottom where you can just Google Michigan DNR Forest Health, you get some links to some viewers. And I've got the HRD viewer up on the screen here. And you can zoom in on this and see that there's actually more dots than show up on the zoomed out view. 
but most of our HRD is in the western, uh, northern lower um, peninsula of Michigan, and the red dots are where we've confirmed HRD, and there's kind of a lighter red or pink halo surrounding the red dots. That would be that five-mile buffer area. Gray dots are where surveys have occurred, but we have not um, detected any HRD. And then yellow dots are where the public has reported potential HRD, and we need to follow up on it. So in the Upper Peninsula, about an hour from Sault Ste. Marie, we do have um, one location that is positive in Newberry, Michigan, and uh, that's the only location we're aware of in the UP currently at uh, this point in time. You can also um, click on, a, there's a box at the top left of the screen with a little tree on it, black box. You click on that, you get information on HRD and fungi that look similar. That can be helpful. So we've got a couple of viewers like this. I'll talk about one that we have for oak wilt in a minute as well. <clears throat> so within our five-mile buffer area on state land in Michigan, we um, would have restrictions if the risk of HRD is, is high. So the forest health team will go in and survey all of the pine plantations on state land that would be um, harvested or thinned in the next year. And um, we would consider putting this restriction on those stands where harvests would either have to occur during the winter when there's low levels of spores present, low risk of infecting stumps, or treating those stumps immediately after harvest with either rot stop C, which is a, a biological control fungus that's applied to the stumps, or solutrate, which is a borate product. Emerald ash borer, um, just this month actually, the uh, Michigan um, repealed the quarantine on, on ash due to emerald ash borer. We have found EAB in um, all but three of our Michigan counties. There's some counties in the western upper peninsula where it hasn't been detected, but um, there's a strong likelihood that it's present due to infestations that aren't far away. So um, at this point in time, it, within Michigan and adjacent states that have also rescinded their quarantine, um, ash trees, logs, uh, ash materials can now move freely, um, but it, currently it's still restricted moving ash to our state lands. Um, the DNR is also proposing firewood restrictions on state lands and um, those are not yet in effect, but the idea would be that out-of-state firewood um, would be restricted coming to state land, as well as firewood moving between the Upper Peninsula and Lower Peninsula to state land. And that would be because of our other invasive pests that we're also concerned about within state. Um, and, uh, oak wilt would be a major concern, and then other pests like Asian longhorn beetle that have not been detected in Michigan and, and even pests that we may not even be thinking about at this point in time. So the, the quarantine, I think, was um, useful and did slow down the, the spread of emerald ash borer and did give us time to prepare for the, the point where we're at now with uh, widespread infestation. Oak wilt is a, a big concern in Michigan. It's been increasing since the 1980s, and at this point we have oak wilt in uh, 56 of our 82 Michigan counties. And typically what we're seeing initially would be individual trees that um, develop symptoms, leaves falling rapidly from the upper portion of the canopy with the leaf scorch and then these expanding pockets of mortality where you have trees in the middle that died a few years ago and then trees at the outside that would be just beginning to die in any given growing season. And this would be our oak forests, uh, particularly our red oak forests here in Michigan. And classic symptoms here, the leaf scorch at the margin of the leaf and then the leaf drop that you would be seeing from 
infected trees. And once we suspect oak wilt in a given site, we do go ahead and ensure that we're confirming that. In Michigan right now, we're using a couple of methods for confirmation. First would be collecting fresh branch samples. Um, these would be branches that show symptoms but are not yet uh, completely dried out and dead. Or the presence of pressure pads. And the pressure pads would be produced by the oak wilt fungus on trees that died the previous growing season. So if we find those, we can be confident that we do have oak wilt at the site. Once we, we know we have sites with oak wilt, then we have to make decisions about management. And in our high value oak forests, we will go in and, um, and, and cut the root grafts that would allow the fungus to spread from one tree to the next to prevent those, those pockets from continuing to expand. So just this week, we finished up um, vibratory plowing to cut those root grafts at the west end of the Upper Peninsula. And um, soon we're going to start doing those treatments in the Lower Peninsula. And this year we anticipate treating about a little over 13,000 feet or um, over 4,000 meters to, um, to contain oak wilt in pockets. Along with that, we'll also remove the spore-producing trees. So when the, the trees die this year, we would anticipate that they produce pressure pads and the um, spore mats next spring. And the sap-feeding beetles that Mike talked about earlier would pick up those spores and bring them to wounds on healthy trees. So by removing these spore-producing trees, we can reduce the amount of the inoculum that would be present. Here's our oak wilt viewer. Again, it's present on our website. And uh, if you zoomed in, there'd actually be more dots than we see there. But the, the red dots are where we've done, where we've confirmed oak wilt. Blue dots are where we've done treatments. And then yellow dots would be where we suspect oak wilt is present, but we have not yet been able to confirm it. Um, many times it may be we don't have trees at the right stage to, to uh, collect a sample for culturing, and we're not able to find pressure pads. And so this um, site is, again, just a place where people can go to see where we've confirmed oak wilt. It doesn't necessarily represent everywhere in Michigan that oak wilt is present. And, um, and it also allows people to report oak wilt to us for us to, to confirm and um, determine if indeed it is present at those locations. <clears throat> we spend a lot of time on oak wilt prevention as well. And right now, um, the research that's been done suggests that the primary risk of oak wilt spread would be April 15th to July 15th in Michigan. And so we try to avoid wounding oaks during that time, particularly if it's near areas where oak wilt is known to occur. That's the one time we'd use tree wound dressings to protect trees from infection, to keep those insects away. And uh, then also we try to address concerns about firewood, and uh, firewood from oaks in areas with oak wilt would need to be um, treated to ensure that that is not a risk of, of spreading the disease. Um, that Michigan Invasive uh, Species um, Funding Program that we have has funded oak wilt research at Michigan State University. And because there hasn't been a lot of research in Michigan on when these periods of high risk would be for infection with oak wilt, uh, they are taking another uh, a close look at that in Michigan to determine if that spring and early summer time period is indeed the, the only high risk period that we have in Michigan. And they're also looking at the likelihood of a wounded oak developing an infection. They're also developing a, a more rapid, um, accurate testing method for samples. 
so that we can more easily confirm the disease, perhaps from trees that have been dead a little bit longer so that we don't need to rely on that fresh branch sample. And then they're also looking at the genetics of the oak wilt fungus from across the U.S. to, um, to determine if it's possible to trace back a new infection to a point of origin. So those were some of the, the major invasive forest pests that we're spending a lot of time on in Michigan right now. I also wanted to talk just briefly about a few of the other issues we saw this year. And one of those would be just the impacts of the drought that we had, that particularly in the northern lower peninsula, we did have severe drought during the growing season this year. And we saw a lot of oak decline in northern Michigan. It gets confused with oak wilt. Uh, a lot of leaf scorch on a few different species. Even some of our regeneration um, in the picture in the upper right there showing a, uh, a site where we're regenerating oak after harvest and had a lot of impacts on a few of these sites with some of those sprouts uh, being killed as well due to the drought. The other pests that we saw in oak this year in the northwest lower um, peninsula, this would be primarily pretty close to the lake shore, was oak skeletonizer. And uh, we were getting some reports of, of uh, what was suspected to be oak wilt or trees that are dying quite quickly, and it was the skeletonizer. Most of the damage occurs late in the growing season. so. Um, we do tend to have outbreaks every once in a while in Michigan of this pest, and uh, we don't have a lot of reports of tree mortality as a result. But I did see uh, some of this damage in other areas, including the Sault Ste. Marie area, even here in Sault Ste. Marie, Ontario, on some northern red oak, where we had a much lower level of infestation there. And um, I'm just kind of curious if that's going to end up becoming a, a more significant issue in the next few years or if it's just going to kind of stay in the background. Spruce budworm, um, from 2014 through 2017, we had a lot of defoliation of fir and spruce, particularly in the upper peninsula and in the northern lower peninsula. Um, in 2018, it was very difficult to find spruce budworm damage. And uh, we really had to look to, to even find spruce budworm out there on trees. So our aerial surveys didn't pick up very much damage at all in 2018. And uh, we're kind of curious what's going to happen there, if this is the end of the epidemic for a while, or if that's going to come back. In, in Michigan, it's my understanding that uh, we tend to have several years of defoliation and then a few decades where it, it stops being an issue for a while. Um, the, the DNR is uh, identifying and harvesting high-risk, mature uh, fir and spruce as a, as a result of spruce budworm. We also uh, saw a fair amount of uh, what we're calling spruce decline this year, um, particularly in northern Michigan. In, and some of this could be old spruce budworm damage, but also a lot of defoliation of the lower branches, interior branches that um, is due to needle diseases, uh, rhizosphera and stigmina needle cast. And um, this, uh, these diseases can build up when you have cool, wet summers, and perhaps last summer being a cool, wet summer allowed these diseases to begin to build up on um, uh, white spruce and um, in some um, ornamental landscapes, the Colorado blue spruce trees of that type. Forest tent caterpillar. In 2016, we had some small localized areas of defoliation. And um, in 2017, those areas expanded. Uh, this year, we had severe defoliation in the east upper peninsula and in the lower uh, northern Lower Peninsula in localized areas, primarily on sugar maple and on aspen. And uh, we anticipate that this should crash, these populations should crash in the next couple of years and, and give us 
um, several years, maybe eight to ten years before it becomes an issue again based on past history in Michigan. European gypsy moss is a, a pest that has become naturalized in Michigan at this point. Um, back in the 1990s when it was first um, becoming an issue in the state, there was severe defoliation. Since that time, we tend to get localized outbreaks associated with dry springs when the entomophaga fungus and viruses that uh, help to keep the, the populations low are not as effective. And in 2017, we had um, some outbreaks in the northeast lower peninsula, and then this year in southeast and southwest Michigan, uh, gypsy moth uh, localized outbreaks were present. And then we saw on some um, spruce some pretty significant defoliation from gypsy moth, which was kind of unusual, at least for us. And then the last thing I wanted to mention was our website. And um, again, you can do a Google search for Michigan DNR Forest Health and get to our website. You can get to our viewers there, as well as see our annual forest health highlights. And um, the, uh, the 2017 forest health highlights are currently up, and um, we'd anticipate having the 2018 forest health highlights up probably sometime next spring. And uh, so that's, that's all I have today. I'm happy to take any questions.